Okay. Everybody ready? Go ahead and pull up your general chat in Slack. That is going to have an example email header in it. Okay. What's email? What's that? Electronic mail. What does it mean? How does it get someplace? Shout them out a lot louder. I can't hear you folks. What did you say? Oh, it uses a server. It uses a server. Okay, good. It uses a server. What else do you know about email? Travels via the internet. It's magic. Okay. <laughs> this is one of the greatest parts about this particular class, which is that because I get to do the, the basics of the internet, I get a chance to personally refresh my own memory and my own knowledge about how a lot of this stuff works. I've, I've said to a lot of people before that the best way possible to learn anything is to teach it. And so I had to go and refresh myself uh, and remember what all of those initials stand for and stuff like that. So there's three different parts to an email. Does anybody know what those parts of the email are? Take, okay, and when you, when you answer, don't stay quiet. Shout to everybody. If you're wrong, you're wrong. What's the consequence of being wrong in here? You're one step closer to being right. Thank you. You're one step closer to being right. New favorite student. Okay. What's another consequence of being wrong in here? Yes, one. Ramon. Were you stretching? Yeah. Okay. The sole consequence of being wrong in here is that I will admire you for giving it a shot. That is the only consequence. You don't lose points for being wrong in here. There's no consequence to being wrong. This is the place to be wrong. I'm not gonna fire you, right? And if you were my employee, I still wouldn't fire you. I would be thrilled that you asked me before you checked in bad code, right? Please use this opportunity now to shout out what you think the right answer is. If it's the wrong answer, the most I'm going to do is say no, but here's the correct answer. And I will admire you for giving it a shot. But don't mumble. Don't be, don't be quiet. Don't be scared to say something. This is the place where I do my best to inoculate you against institutional thinking for the rest of the time that you're in school. Institutional thinking will tell you that there is a penalty to being wrong and that people will look down on you in the exact opposite way technology will reward you for perpetually, constantly being loud and wrong, okay? Be loud and be wrong as many times as you can because that means that you're trying as hard as you can to learn. There are three parts to an email. One is the envelope, the next is the header, and the third is the body. What do you think those things are? What do you think the envelope is? What it's sent in. That's a really good way to put it. Um, it is the, the capsule that most of us will never see that the email protocol operates in. Have you ever seen, um, I don't know how many of you have, have ever seen this. Um, do you know the vacuum tubes that they used to use for, for taking checks at banks that would go like this and suck? It, yeah, it's pneumatic tubes. Um, and they use those still in a lot of buildings some places. If you look at a pneumatic tube, the capsule itself and the tube that it travels in could be a good analog for the envelope, okay? And if you looked at the deposit slip and the cash that you've got in there, you might think of the deposit slip as the header and the cash as the body of the envelope. And I mean C-A-S-H, not C-A-C-H-E, right? Is that a pretty good analog for what's going on here? Okay, there's the process, there's the directions, and then there's the stuff. All right? Most of us only ever see the stuff. Now, the first thing on the envelope is don't worry about that for the moment because it gets kind of complex. What, what matters more is how it gets someplace than why. And so the, the envelope is the why, the process will be the how. And that's what we'll talk mostly about. The header is the directions. And then the body is the cat picture that your mom just sent you. Again, and again, and again, and the chain letter that your auntie just sent you and your grandma and she's so mad at you because you didn't pass it on to your auntie and then there's that email and the recriminations and then there's the Snopes link that you have to send back and then there's the questions from all of your relatives as to why it is that this Snopes.com site is any different than the rest of the internet when it comes to credibility and those are clearly my issues but I'm guessing that many of you in here have experienced the same. Okay, <laughs> so here in the uh, Slack chat is a 
sample email header. When you're trying to get something from one place to another, what are the two basic things that you need to know to get something from one place to another? Where it's going to be sent and when is a good is a good answer for it. But really, what you need to get a line is two points, right? Two points in space. One is where it's from, and the other is where it's going. Okay, and there's some complexity to that, but basically what you need is to know where it's been, where it's going, and the reason why is if something happens, have you ever received an email bounce back before? How does the email know how to send it back to you again? What's that? Yes. Exactly. It only knows where it came from. Well, it does know where it was going, and it's telling you, sorry, there's no there there. The, the, the mailbox ain't taking it. It's not working. Okay? So you need to know those two things, and then you also need to know what are you going to include in the message. Does anybody know why Twitter is 140 characters? It's because the SMS protocol has room for 192 characters, and a Twitter, a tweet, has to contain within it a header message that lets you know where to send that tweet, right? So there's a lot of similarities between email and SMS, and I'm, I can hear the enraged screams from people that I know right now saying, oh my god, they're nothing like each other. But the truth is, is that a tweet is very much like an email. It knows where it's been, it knows where it's going, and it knows some stuff that you don't need to know about the Twitter protocol. In that same way, that stuff you don't need to know about the Twitter protocol is like the envelope for email. Don't worry about it for now. What matters is the header, because we're going to pull this apart and show you how email actually works. Okay, what do you think the return path is? Are you looking at the headers in in the general channel right here? Remember, this is a this is an example header right here of of sample information. Yes, the return path is where it came from. Sometimes it really is that easy, just looking at it and going, this isn't really jargon, it's just exactly what it looks like. It's just that it's all mushed together with a lot of brackets and a lot of weird stuff. Return path is exactly what it sounds like. It's return to sender if needed information, right? This is where it came from, t at the terra.com, something like that. All right, what do you think the X spam catcher score probably is? Shout it out. It is possibly that. It's possibly some kind of, and this is going to be very interesting for you, mail transfer agent. Can somebody go let her in? Mail transfer agent. And a mail transfer agent is part of how email gets sent from place to place. Okay? So if a mail transfer agent is part of how email gets sent from place to place, one of those agents might be a spam catcher. It might be a filter through which that email has to go to make sure that it's not a Nigerian prince offering me $25 million in his hand in marriage. Right? Okay, received from, a lot of this is, is just, yeah, a lot of this is just information that says this is where this came from. How many of you have seen Stargate, the movie, the 1994 movie? Clearly, clearly superior in every single way to the television show, although that has its own benefits, right? Do you remember when James Spader drew the points in, in a line to show how what you require to get from one location to another is the definition of the origin point and a destination? Remember how there were all of those points that, sh that said, here is where this is located in space and time. If you take that mental model and translate it over to email, this is some of the information that draws you that location in time. It's not just the email address and the IP that it comes from, but there's also the qualifications about who might have sent that email address, what time it was sent, information that, that lets the email servers know the uniqueness of this email message. Okay, And then you have a destination point bill at microsoft.com, right? Okay. So there's some stuff in here, MIME version, the to, the subject, user agent, stuff like this. User agent, by the way, if you see this right here, usually means something like where it was sent from in terms of the browser or maybe it's sent from Mac mail on my, on my client. But mostly this is just information that draws a point in space and says this is where this is coming from. Okay. I'm going to ask you some acronyms, and as with everything else in technology, the acronyms are the scary part until you understand exactly what they mean, okay? How many of you have heard of POP3? Raise your hands. IMAP. 
SMTP, TCP IP. Okay. The way that email works is like this. I create a message and I want to send it somewhere, right? So the internet needs to know how to find the place that I want to send it. And we're going to talk more about DNS, domain name service, at the end of this week. But for now, assume that a little birdie tells it where to go. Well, I'll break that, that little birdie apart into many little pieces on Wednesday. The first thing that we do when we're sending an email message is the server that is going to receive your email message gets a notification from your mail client. And I'm simplifying drastically here. But if I package up an email and I send it out into the internet, the first thing that happens is the uh, domain name at the end, like yahoo.com or gmail.com is stripped away. And then a server on the internet says, I know where those IP addresses are located for the Gmail email servers. So I'm gonna send that email there. And a server that does that kind of routing on the internet is called a mail transfer agent. Okay, there's lots of those everywhere. There's, there's lots, I, do, I don't have a number for it, but I'm sure there's tens of thousands of those boxes to route Gmail email messages everywhere. All right, very, there, in fact, I happen to know for sure that there's only one that routes the Terra.com messages anywhere, because that's my email server. My email server, the Terra.com, has been registered on a domain name server so that if you send an email to me, the DNS server points it at the server where lives the Terra.com. All right? Now I'm going to use a metaphor that I've used several times before, which is to say that a server or a computer, and I'll conflate those for the moment, on the internet is a lot like a house with a lot of doors in it. All right? Uh, there is a website called theterra.com. There's an email server that lets people know where to send or the internet know where to send email messages. There's some interesting stuff like an SSH server at theterra.com so that I can go and find that server that all of my stuff lives on and get there, all right? If that, ha if that computer is like a house, this is a house with lots and lots of doors. In fact, there's about 65,000 doors to this house, all right? When a computer is looking for, when an email message is being routed to a server like Gmail, um, and it is looking for a secure location to send an email message to, it goes and knocks on door number 993 in that house. That is what happens when you send an email message via the simple message transfer protocol. Okay, that's SMTP. That's what happens when you send a message someplace. Okay, SMTP goes and knocks on door number 993 of this house and says, is there somebody behind this door that will take this message? If you've done everything right, there is, and that message is received and then it just lives inside that house for a moment. And just imagine that message hanging there inside that house. At that moment, your mail client, and whichever client that might be, you might be accessing it via web, via mail, via Outlook, gets a notice that says this didn't bounce back. Or more accurately, it waits for that notice that says bounce back, and when it doesn't receive it, you might receive something like a send successful message, okay? So, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, it will bounce back. If you try to send an email message to a, uh, an email address that doesn't exist, like if you tried to send an email message to ed at theterra.com, there's no email address ed at theterra.com. So the first thing that happens is it goes and it looks for that door in the house and says, hello, I'm here. Is there is there a there there? Then that message inside the internet, what is it? Um, God, I can't even remember right now. IMAP, Internet Ma uh, Message Access Protocol, Internet Mail Access Protocol. Yes, right. Then the server that lives on that computer sits there and goes, okay, I'm, I'm looking at an email message right now. And I know it came from ed at gmail.com. And it is to t at the terra.com. Does somebody with that email address live at this house? Yes, there does. So it is delivered into the correct room in the house where t at the terra.com email messages live. All right. Now the difference, and I'll, I might get into the difference between POP and IMAP as a protocol in a little bit, but the truth is, is that IMAP is more relevant to you all. Um, 
if you're using the school's email services, if you're using Gmail, anything like that, you can, you could opt to use the POP protocol, which is just post office protocol. But what that means is that after a copy of the original message is delivered to your email account and you download or delete that someplace, it's gone on your, in your account. In Internet Mail Access Protocol, what happens is that is a protocol that lets you access your mail from multiple different locations and is stored on a central server. This is the way Gmail operates. Okay, When you use um, Outlook or any of the mail clients you have on your phones, like if you use Android's mail client or iPhone's mail client and you have logged into a Gmail account, I'm, I'm assuming several of you probably have done something like this, or Yahoo, anything like that, um, you can access your account and see the messages that are in there. And if you delete that message on your phone, it doesn't necessarily delete the message on the server, right? Okay. I'm explaining a lot very quickly. And so it's okay if you want to stop me and ask questions right now. Are, are, am I losing any? Okay, go ahead. I have a question. Yes. Um, Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yes, that is exactly what it's doing and why it's doing it. Very good question. When someone sends you a verification email address, what they want to know is, are, are you messing with me right now? Did you give me a real email address? It doesn't necessarily know if it's you, but it wants to know if it's a valid email address. And it's one of the things that sites do to prevent a lot of spammy usage of their services or a drain by bots that are randomly generating email addresses and using them to register on the site. It's very annoying when that happens and it's a problem for people who maintain servers. It takes up data. Not a lot for each one of the fake email addresses, but when you're dealing with billions, that crashes a server. And also that is a point of attack just for future reference for something we call a DDoS attack. Who knows what a DDoS is? Yes. You've heard of it before. Who knows? Go ahead. It's a something denial of service. Distributed denial of service. Very good. Exactly. So that's what happens when you try to overload something is a distributed denial of service attack. And that's what happens when you have multiple computers trying to do the same thing to that site, overload it with whatever the case may be. And there's lots of different variations on that. But that's one of the possibilities that it's trying to prevent. Okay. So in this house lives my email in the room that says t at the terra.com all right and I can access that room from lots of different locations I can access it from my my phone I can access it from my computer here if I want to if I get stuck someplace and I need to go to an internet cafe I could go if I know the credentials for the web servers and go log directly into the webmail for something like t at the terra.com or another one of my email addresses terra fizzmint.com for my company right I can access them from many different locations because my mail is living on a central server. What are some of the problems with mail living on a central server? Yes. Privacy, Privacy is a very good answer to that question. Who owns my email that is running through Google? Google. Yep, Google owns it. Now Google has a policy that anything that is older than six months old in your Google account is freely accessible and indexable inside that company. They can mine your information if it's older than six months. Does it make sense to leave a lot of information on Google servers? Probably not. I don't know the specifics of the Yahoo terms of service, but I'm guessing it's probably pretty similar. All right. One of the best things that you can do for your own, pri your own privacy and security is encrypt your emails using a third-party service. There's a lot of solutions out there, very few good ones. I know some of the people that invented some of the first security protocols for the internet for email. Um, one of them is called Pretty Good Privacy, and it's pretty good. It's terrible to configure. A lot of security pros use it. Um, the, the guy that invented it actually doesn't use it anymore because it's tough to use, but it's damn secure, right? There's a lot of other third-party protocols you can use. There's something called, um, what is it? As, oh, I forgot that one. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff that you can use to make your email more secure. One of the best things that you can do is just delete them as fast as you can. Get rid of them. Don't let Google be looking through your, your email. Same with Yahoo. Same with Seattle Central. Just get rid of them as fast as you can. Treat them as ephemeral and not like a personal database to the best of your capacity. Okay, so Internet Message Access Protocol. I see, and I, I can never remember the, the initials myself. I, I'm often reminded of what happens when I watch something like Scandal. Does anybody here watch Scandal? 
with Olivia Pope and um, okay do you guys not watch television seriously two episodes okay how do you not watch that show it is awesome I mean seriously how many affairs can she have with the president right like individual unique discrete affairs okay anyway so um, so I love that show but I love the horrible techno Babylon because the guy's like the distributed host circuit protocol server and I'm like dude we do not even use the entire name of that it's DHCP right and he didn't even get the name right it's the DHP, DHCP server and nobody actually says the entire word out out loud right so or the entire acronym out loud so nobody even remembers it anymore you have to stop and look wait what does DHCP stand for again so you know that that kind of techno babble it it stops you necessarily always from remembering what everything stands for but unpacking it is kind of fun so if I sit here and go um it is simple message transfer protocol yes that's probably right all right look it up yourselves right what other what other questions do you have about the way that email works do you understand how the directions get you there and then it verifies it and says yep Somebody lives here. Questions? Um, yes? Simple message access protocol. Simple, no, it, simple mail transfer protocol. Simple message transfer protocol, sorry. Yes, see what I mean? What other so questions do you have? Sure. Bounce, 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 bounce. Absolutely. And at each one of those locations, a copy of the message is created to verify, right? So if, if you send a message to the other party, a copy of the message is created through the mail transfer agents to make sure at each point of those each one of those points that the message is right, right? And then it'll verify back. And then in good mail transfer agents, any excess copies will be deleted. But if you've ever heard like Techno babble in movies talking about how to go get emails off the server or catch them in transit, or something called a man in the middle attack, maybe, which is often used in bad, bad techno babble on television shows. That's one of the, the vectors from which that attack can come. Um, yes? So then, for example, if the law wanted to subpoena emails, yes. If the law wanted to subpoena emails from six months ago from Google, they don't even need a subpoena. Google will just hand them over. Okay. Oh, yeah. So that would be how they can That is one of the ways that law enforcement goes through and reviews people's emails and looks for code words and things like that, yes. And that's also any party that wants to get their hands on your emails. Google owns them at that point. So anytime you use any Google mm -hmm. or email server like Google, Yahoo, or... Very good question. Anytime you use a third party service for your email, read that terms of service really carefully because they can read your mail too. All right? Um, there are ways to steal and redirect email, yes. It's, it's hard to do, but it's, it's quite possible. I think the question, maybe if, I'm, if I can restate this the right way, is what you're looking for is some kind of reassurance that other people can't read your email and what possibilities there are for you. Run your own email server is the best possibility with, your own, with everything that you know about email. And this, this is something you could do. You could do it yourself by the end of this class if you wanted to. All right, and the other one is to use a, a third-party service that has guarantees about end-to-end -end encryption. There are some options that are out there for that too. But basically, the sum total of the lesson for today is email is about as secure as handing a physical letter to a postal worker. Sure, you trust that the system is going to get your letter there, but you don't really know what's going to happen to it in the meantime. And if someone wants to steam open that envelope, what are you going to do to stop them? So, the, the, the moral of today's story is delete everything on third-party servers as fast as you can and don't use them as databases for your own personal information, all right? People get trapped when they've got 10 years of Yahoo emails and someone goes through them and, down, and, and downloads. I think it was Sarah Palin lost something like two gigs of her emails during the 2008 presidential election. Do you all remember that? Yeah. Huge, huge personal data breach. And that is helped 
by not using third-party services and deleting things as fast as you can. Once they're off the servers, Google has made a promise to delete them once you've trashed them all. But if you leave those mails in your account, they can parse them any way they want to. Any last questions? Okay, good. All righty. 